Good morning. Please open your Bibles with me to the end of 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 5. This morning and next week, Lord willing, we will conclude our study of 1 Peter, which by that time will have spanned 68 sermons and began in the summer of 2021, which is kind of a long time. I don't know if I should apologize or not for that, but facts are facts, and that's what it is. I have very much enjoyed it. And we've seen just a, a little bit of review and survey that First Peter is written to Christians spread over a larger geographical area of what would now be known as Turkey, written to those who are suffering or were going to suffer severe persecution under Emperor Nero. And Peter has encouraged these Christians by reminding them of the glory that has already begun to, to work in them, the power of God to save them that has already uh, been implanted in their souls and the glory that's ahead of them that Jesus Christ has already won for them and into which he has already entered ahead of them. And Peter has, has written this letter to Christians really in the in-between who have begun to experience this life and are waiting to experience it in fullness. And Peter has commanded us until that time to endure suffering, to uh, be faithful in our callings. He went through um, citizens being s subject to authorities and servants being subject to masters and wives being subject to husbands and husbands being good husbands to their wives. In every place in society, while we are here, we need to honor God and glorify him in the way that we live. And Peter has encouraged us to follow Jesus' example. He suffered and then entered into glory, so also we must suffer and enter, enter into glory. But our suffering is, is transformed. Jesus suffered to save us from our sins. He suffered as a, a means of atonement, and expiation to, to suffer in our place and thereby we have forgiveness and we have the righteousness of Jesus given to us. And he won glory. It was given to him as a reward. For us, our, neither our suffering nor our entrance into glory are the same. Uh, They're only the same in the sense that we participate in what Christ has done for us. We follow his example. So we suffer not by, by way of atonement, but by way of the fact that the servant is not greater than, than the master, and this is the way that he has called us to go. And we do not enter into heaven as a reward, but as the inheritance that Jesus has won for us. And, and yet for all that, though there are differences between our suffering and entrance into glory, there is the, beautif the beauty of the fact that it is God's eternal glory into which we have been called. There is no way around this pattern and this example. And last week we studied Peter's words where he communicates to us in chapter 5 and verse 10 these precious promises of restoration, that God himself will make us whole and perfect in soul and in body so that we can enjoy that eternal glory and perfect communion with God to which he has called us and which Jesus Christ has won for us. Let's pick up the reading there at that verse, 1 Peter 5, verse 10, to get the flow of the text, and then we'll continue our reading to the end of the letter. So this is 1 Peter chapter 5, beginning in verse 10 and reading to the end. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. By Silvanus, a faithful brother, as I regard him, I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. She who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings, and so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with the kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. To study this text, we'll have just two main headings this morning, each with a few subpoints, two main headings, and then we'll have two more main headings next week to conclude the letter. And the first of these two main headings is dominion and doxology. 
dominion and doxology. In verse 10, Peter calls Paul, excuse me, <clears throat> Peter calls God the God of all grace. And then in verse 11, Peter praises God with this expression, to him, to the God of all grace, be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. You'll find expressions like this elsewhere in 1 Peter and throughout the letters of the apostles in the New Testament. Uh, and among those various expressions, there are five others that ascribe dominion to God. To him be the dominion or similar phrases. So what are these expressions and how should we understand them? Would you consider three subpoints here with me to better understand this? Number one, a confession of faith. A confession of faith. When you read something like this, you need to understand that it is that person confessing what they believe. They are giving voice, they're putting words to what they believe. Peter is saying, he is confessing publicly, I believe that God has dominion over all things. It's a public confession of Peter's faith, but it's one that he invites others to join in because he concludes it with the word, Amen, so be it, in such a way that other people can respond and say, Amen, to him be the dominion forever and ever, and we all say, Amen. To add an Amen, as we usually say here in the United States, or an Amen, to a statement is to declare our hearty affirmation of what has been said. God is sovereign, God has the dominion, and we declare so be it, or yes it is, or amen. You've probably heard this many times in sermons, but it's, it's a helpful illustration that when we read in, our, in the Gospels that Jesus says, verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto you, what it says in the Greek is, amen, amen, truly, truly, or verily, verily. So if you put that at the beginning of a statement, you're emphasizing the truth of what you're about to say, of what you're about to say. If you put it at the end of a statement, then it's an affirmation of what has been said. This is indeed true. And that's why we conclude our prayers and our praises, our hymns, always with an amen, because it allows, in prayers especially, one person speaks. But everyone is praying, though one person speaks. And so the amen at the end is a way for each of us and all of us to say, we have prayed this prayer with him. We affirm it together. And the praises we all sing together with our voices, so it's clear we, we all believe these things. But the amen is a fitting conclusion. So Peter is publicly confessing his faith. He's believing and confessing that God has dominion and sovereignty over all things and all persons in all places, and he affirms and ratifies it with an amen to which we are invited to add our own amens as we confess the same faith with Peter or on the part of any speaker who would make a similar expression. Secondly, this is not just a confession of faith. It is also, secondly, an expression of worship. <clears throat> Whom is Peter addressing? when he says, to him be the dominion forever and ever. It is a confession of faith publicly on our level to one another, but more properly or more directly, he's directing himself to God. So this is an expression of worship. He is worshiping God. Now, there's a term, there's a, a word for an expression of praise to God, and that is a doxology. A doxology is an expression of praise to God. We begin our services with what we call the doxology. And what do we sing in the doxology? We sing praise to the Father and praise to the Son and praise to the Holy Ghost, just as we do at the conclusion of our services with the Gloria Patri. They're both doxologies as we attribute glory and honor and praise and worship to God. So Peter is worshiping God with this phrase. Whom do we worship and why do we worship them? We worship those who are worthy of worship. Worship is always always follows worthiness. We give worship to those who are worthy 
of worship, and there is only one who is truly worthy of worship, and that is God. But what I, what I want us to see here is that because this is an expression of worship, because God is worthy, worthiness is first and worship follows it, it's important to understand this and equivalent expressions not as petitions or asking or hoping or wishing something, but as expressions of worship. Peter is not saying, and, and may God have the dominion, and would that God had the dominion, but he is saying, I attribute to God what he already possesses, the dominion and sovereignty over all things. Peter does not express this as though God is in need of dominion or seeking dominion or establishing dominion or accumulating dominion, and Peter prays, may so be it. He's not saying to him be the dominion forever and ever. I hope so someday. He's saying, I worship God for his dominion, which endures forever. His is the dominion. In 1 Peter, look back at chapter 4 and verse 11. Peter has already said this. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. They belong to him. He doesn't need us to ascribe them to him so that he might have it. He possesses it, and therefore we ascribe it to him. Peter gives glory to God and ascribes dominion to him, to him be the dominion, not as though he needs it, and Peter prays that he will possess it more fully, but because God is the possessor of all glory and dominion, therefore Peter worships him. Worthiness precedes worship. Now, we often encourage people to be or to, to be what they are not, or to do what they are capable of doing. So you see someone cheering for an athlete, and they say, you can do it, you can do it. Or you see a parent say to their child, you're so brave, you've got this. <laughs> but when the parent says, you're so brave, there's a great deal of uncertainty as to the bravery of the child, isn't it? <laughs> but they're trying to convince the child that they can be brave, or that they should be brave, or that they are brave. To you is the bravery, my child, we hope. Or to you as the strength, athlete, we hope. You've got this. You can do it. Peter is not saying that kind of thing. He's not saying to God, you can have the dominion, God. I just know it. He's worshiping God to whom is all dominion because it belongs to him. He is worthy of all praise. He is worthy of all doxology. God possesses all dominion. And so therefore, to give him doxology is appropriate. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't mention it, but <clears throat> doxology is a, a simple expression from Greek where doxe means glory, and logia would be an expression, something that you verbalize. So doxologia would be an expression of glory, giving glory to God, praising him. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below is a doxology as we give glory and praise to him. But thirdly, the third subpoint under this first heading, we need to understand this in a more nuanced way. Number three, glory is given but not gotten. Those who attend the adult Sunday school class can take a five-minute nap because we're going to review what we've been studying recently in those lessons. When we attribute glory to God, or when we attribute dominion to God, it is right and proper and true to say that we are giving glory to God. We are giving glory to God, but we cannot say that we are adding glory to God, or that he is getting glory from us. So we give glory, but glory is not gotten. What does that mean? It sounds like a contradiction. How can we glorify God if God doesn't get glory from us? Well, what's happening is that when we praise God in these doxologies with a statement like Peter's, 
what's happening is that we are increasing the testimony of God's glory in the world. Creation is the theater of God's glory and the sound of his glory, the testimony of his glory reverberates all the louder and shines all the brighter when we glorify God. But that increase of glory is taking place in the creation as we glorify God here. It is not taking place in God himself because God in himself and of himself possesses all gloriousness and blessedness and he does not derive any glory from the creatures or receive any glory from the creatures in any way that would increase the glory that he possesses in and of himself. So it is true that we glorify God and it is true that we can glorify God more or less, but God is not getting more glory or losing glory as a result in himself, although there is more glory or less glory for God in the world. If you peer at, uh, in our hymnals, we have our confession of faith at the back, and you can peek at that or you can listen. If you turn to page 671 in the hymnal, it will show you chapter two of our confession of faith, page 671. And this is part of what we confess about God. Page 671, chapter 2, paragraph 2. God, having all life, glory, goodness, blessedness in and of himself, is alone in and unto himself all sufficient, not standing in need of any creature which he hath made, nor deriving any glory from them, but only manifesting his own glory in, by, unto, and upon them. So God possesses all glory in himself and of himself, but in his creatures and in his creation, he manifests his glory. He makes it evident. He makes it visible in them, by them, unto them, and upon them. Now we may ask the question, but what is the glory of God that is increasing or decreasing in the created world? And the glory of God is a, a term that we use to describe all of his perfections in one. It, it, it's not the sum total of his perfection in God himself. It's the sum total of his perfection in our minds. It is his completeness. It is, it is his pure, infinite perfection. When, you, when in our minds, we take all of his attributes and we, we bring them all together, we see one perfect whole, and that is his glory. The, the, the infinity and infinite perfection of God, all that he is, all in one, this is his gloriousness. So if God's glory is his, his infinite perfection, could his infinite perfection that he possesses in and of himself be somehow increased or decreased by creatures? And if that were the case, what kind of being would God have that billions and billions of creatures every day, all day, are constantly adding and subtracting to the glory of God in himself? Would that even be possible? Would that be the life of deity? It most certainly would not. But is that the reality of the world that he's created, that the testimony of his glory increases and the testimony of his glory decreases? As we honor God, it increases. As we dishonor him, it decreases. Yes, that is the truth. So we can glorify God or give him glory, but he's not getting glory from us in himself, although he is getting more glory in the world around him. Let's confirm this from Romans chapter 1. Would you please turn with me to Romans chapter 1? It's similar to how God has dominion over all things, but people are more or less obedient to him in the world. Where people disobey God, is he lacking dominion in and of himself as though his sovereignty has somehow been robbed from him in that place? No, he has sovereignty even over wicked men, praise the Lord. But not all men are, are obedient to him. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. But God is not lacking dominion and sovereignty when men disobey him. So also God is not lacking in glory when men dishonor him. That's, that's what we're going to see in Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 21. For although they knew God, that's his creatures, man, uh, apart, man fallen, 
For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God. Notice they are not honoring him. They're not giving him glory as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Verse 23, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. So the God who is infinitely perfect in and of himself, they represent him as birds, or they represent him as creeping animals, this, this great bull. This is your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt, Israel, and, and other things. This is really talking about pagan idolatry, but Israel participated in pagan idolatry. They exchanged the glory of the immortal God. They did not honor him as God, and they exchanged his glory for created things. Uh, skip down to verse 25. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator. But then what does Paul say? Who is blessed forever? And, then, and another doxology here, amen. See how in verse 21 and 23, God is not honored. His glory is exchanged. Verse 25, it's, it's exchanged for a lie, something dishonorable. And yet for all that, Paul says, God is blessed forever. Man's failure to give him glory did not diminish his glory. It did not subtract for the, from the blessedness and felicity of God in himself. As one commentator, Andrew Willett, said, God, notwithstanding this insolent treatment offered to him by idolaters, sustained no loss thereby. He still remained blessed forever. Now, is this a free pass in the world? Well, God has all glory in and of himself, and he does not derive any from us, but simply manifests it in and by and upon and unto us. Therefore, it's no big deal if we dishonor him. It's no big deal if we don't glorify him. To him be the dominion, I guess, but he has it already, right? No. God is jealous for his own glory. God possesses all glory in and of himself, but he demands that in the theater of his glory, that is creation, and in the things that he has made, his creatures, he demands that they give him the glory that he is due. He is worthy of all worship and praise and service and obedience. He is inherently, it, it is because of who he is that he is worthy of us giving him glory and serving him. And he alone, that's why he is jealous for his glory. There is no other. And so we should never think to ourselves, well, it's okay to dishonor him, or it's not a big deal if we dishonor him, or if we fail to glorify him, or fail to honor him. No, he demands that his creatures give him glory, and he is worthy of it. And it is indeed, it should be the natural language of the believer to give glory to God and to praise him for all that he has done, because we worship him not only as creator, but also as redeemer who has given us common grace and all the good things of this world and special grace, all the good things of the world to come in Christ Jesus and himself, the greatest glory of all and the greatest good of all. We teach our children that the chief end of man, the reason why we're, we were created is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever, forever. And then they say, and then we ask, how can you glorify God? By loving him and keeping his commands. So there's, there's no uh, escape clause here. Well, God has all glory in himself, so don't worry about it. No, the, every, every man, woman, and child ought to give glory to God, and every believer ought to give glory to God, and it is sin not to do so because he is worthy, and he demands that we do so. And yet for all this, he remains blessed forever because the glory of God is not fluctuating lower or higher depending on honor and dishonor in the world, and what a life that would be for God if that were his life, if his glory were dependent on us. But because the testimony of God's grace or God's glory does increase or decrease in this world, we want it to be as loud as possible and as bright as possible where we live and where we work and where we serve the Lord. We want God's glory to shine in us, and we want men to see our good works that they might glorify your Father. So brothers and sisters, when we see Peter say, to him be dominion forever and ever, amen, it should be a reminder to us that we 
need to, to spread God's glory and, and spread his dominion through our obedience and through our love and through our worship and our service, not because God lacks it and we fill it up, but so that it is more clear, more evident, more visible, and more present to the world in which we live and our neighbors around us. Now, before we proceed to the, to, to the next main heading, I want to ever so briefly express a pet peeve of mine. And that is, you should understand that doxologies and benedictions are two different things. Doxologies and benedictions. Oftentimes in churches, when it comes to the benediction, what is a benediction? Benediction, it's to pronounce a blessing on God's people. Benediction is to bless God's people. A doxology is to give praise to God. They're distinct things. But oftentimes doxologies are expressed as benedictions, and they sound very fitting to conclude a service, but they're not a benediction. So if you ever are leading a service or if you're in a, a situation where you're concluding something and it's appropriate to have a benediction, just be sure it is a benediction and not a doxology. Pet peeve finished. Okay, second, and here, you know what's really ironic is that this sheet of benedictions has a lot of doxologies on it. That's our fault. Oh, well. Second heading, number two, having seen dominion and doxology, better understanding what doxologies are, that God has all dominion, but we ascribe it to him because he has it. Secondly, now we come to questions and commitment. Questions and commitment. This is looking at verse 12. The Apostle Peter says, By Silvanus, a faithful brother, as I regard him, I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. Just a brief mention of Silvanus is here, a companion and co-worker of Paul and Timothy, who had traveled a lot among the churches in Asia Minor uh, with Paul, and at times at Paul's request would go to other places separate from Paul. And it's probably that Silas and Silvanus are the same person, where Silas would simply be a shortened version of the same name. And Peter here tells us that it was with Silvanus's help that this letter probably was written, uh, probably dictated by Peter and written down by Silvanus, and then definitely delivered and given to the churches by Silvanus himself. Scholars debate, did he just write it down or did he just deliver it? And he, no matter what, Silvanus was clearly pivotal in the... the making this happen, making sure these churches get this letter from the Apostle Peter. Those details don't, don't change anything about our understanding or appreciation of the letter. But what I want us to see here is uh, it's interesting that Peter gives us his own commentary about his own letter. He, he's written his letter or caused it to be written through dictation, and then he tells us how we should think about what he's written. He gives us an authorized commentary on his own letter. With all the self-conscious authority of an apostle of Jesus Christ, he states that he has written it, exhorting and declaring that this, this letter that I've caused to be written to you briefly, is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. What he has written is the true grace of God, and therefore it ought to be received and believed as such. Let's consider three subpoints here also. And that's, this will take us through the rest of the sermon. Number one, we see in the first place that authenticity establishes certainty. Authenticity establishes certainty. If Peter needs to remind them or reassure them that this is the true grace of God, it tells us that there were questions that there were doubts. Even in the dawning days of the church, even when the apostles are still alive, members of the Christian community had doubts even at the most fundamental level. What is the true grace of God? Is it what the apostles are teaching? And it's abundantly evident that there were questions about authenticity from Paul's letters also, where he demonstrates the genuineness of his letters and the way that he writes. 
and the way in which he corrects and rebukes errors of Judaizers to say that's not the true grace of Christ, to insist on circumcision and the law of Moses as necessary for Christianity and salvation is not the true grace of Christ. So there were doubts and questions within the Christian community, but there were also doubts and questions because to some people what the apostles did looked like itinerant um, priests or religious persons who would go town to town, city to city, house to house, and say, would you please offer a donation for such and such a deity and their temple or things like that? There were itinerant religious persons who just made a living off of the the willingness and the gullibility of others uh, who would give money. And so the apostles also insist on their authenticity. Paul, by saying, I took nothing from you. I worked to make my own money, etc. So we see throughout the letters of the New Testament a desire to establish authenticity so that this authenticity establishes certainty. This is the authentic faith. This is the authentic grace of God. It was also necessary because some even went so far as to send false letters in the name of the apostles. We know this from 2 Thessalonians, where Paul says in chapter 2, that they should not be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us. Peter would not say that if there were not letters seeming to be from the apostles. Pseudo-apostles writing pseudo-letters on behalf of the apostles. Fake letters from fake apostles that try to be or assert themselves as genuine and authentic. Peter... Paul said there, let no one deceive you in any way. And you say, who would do this? Your adversary who's a prowling lion and a deceiver. So Satan the deceiver uses men who write false letters claiming to be apostles. And Peter, like Paul, therefore, asserts the authenticity of his message so that the people who receive it say, this is the true grace of God from a true apostle of Jesus Christ, and therefore I can believe it with certainty. Its authenticity establishes certainty, and therefore, though I have questions about this, I'm I'm ready to commit myself, I'm ready to believe this because of its authenticity, which establishes, establishes its certainty. And those who were doubting should acknowledge This to be a letter from an apostle of Jesus Christ, which is therefore to be believed with all certainty based on its authenticity. We see the same kind of sensitivity from Peter himself in chapter 1, where if you remember, he talks about, he says, this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours, searched and inquired carefully concerning it. He wanted the the Gentile Christians to know that the grace of God that they are receiving is the grace of God promised and foretold in the Old Testament. It's authentically apostolic, but it's authentically Old Testamentary, (laughs) to to speak in that way. They are believing that the natural fulfillment and destination of all of God's revelation of everything that God had made known. It's authentic not just to the apostles in their day, it's authentic to the prophets. It's authentic to everything that was revealed before the time of the apostles. This is important in light of the Jews, not just Judaizers, but Jews who entirely rejected Christianity by saying it was a deviation from and a a corruption and a departure from what the Old Testament had taught. No, Peter says this is precisely what the Old Testament taught, and this is the true grace of God. Be certain about it. You may have questions, but commit, because authenticity establishes certainty. Secondly, authority and testimony. Similar to the preceding point, Peter not only asserts the authenticity of the message, the content of this letter is the true grace of God, he also asserts his personal authority 
as one who gives a true testimony. I am an authorized witness, and I give authoritative testimony. Because look, Peter it says, exhorting and declaring, or testifying. Exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. So Peter offers not only the authenticity of the content, but also a personal authority of, as a messenger or as the one who testifies of these things. Now, why should we believe Peter's letter? What, what value does his personal authority carry? Well, Peter was an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, which means that he was a personal eyewitness of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He knew God in the flesh. He lived with God in the flesh. He was a witness to the death of Jesus Christ. And he was a witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it, it changed him entirely. We just read today of the fearful Peter who under pressure and in great distress denies his Lord. And then what do we see in the book of Acts? After the resurrection, after Jesus has restored Peter, we see a bold Peter who, who will not shut his mouth. <laughs> he, he will declare the glories of God and the resurrection of Jesus Christ to everyone and everywhere. What changed him? He was a personal eyewitness of the resurrection of Christ, and he was personally commissioned by Jesus Christ as an apostle. Because it wasn't just the seeing of the resurrection of Christ or the resurrected Lord that made one an apostle. It was also the commission. You are my witnesses, Jesus commissions his apostles. You are the ones who are authorized to testify, authorized to give the testimony. So when Peter says exhorting and declaring, and the word declare is the same word for to testify, it's an authoritative testimony. Just like 1 John, what we have seen what we have heard, what we have touched, what we have beheld, this we declare or testify to you. And it's important to remember that all belief ultimately rests on testimony. Everything you believe rests on testimony of one kind or another. We do not have and cannot have perfect access to all facts and details of all things in any given event or situation but we believe the testimony of persons related to an event who are trustworthy. And we are justified in believing the testimony of eyewitnesses, especially when there are multiple eyewitnesses to one event. And so here we have multiple eyewitnesses of the resurrection of Jesus Christ in the apostles especially, who are then commissioned to make this known to the rest of the world, and Peter, self-consciously authoritative as an apostle and an eyewitness commissioned by Jesus Christ, exhorts and declares and testifies that what he has taught is the true grace of God, which should very naturally lead into this third point. Authority establishes responsibility. Authority establishes responsibility responsibility. One of the lies of the modern world when they say the science and things like that, the science says this and the science says another thing. Scientific investigation is extremely important and wonderful. But one of the, the lies that's woven into that kind of, of speech is the idea that no one's interpreting this. It's simply the facts. It's simply the truth in and of itself. The science says as though it is entirely uninterpreted and self-evidently true, apart from any interpretation. But the fact is, when someone says, the science says, there's a great deal of testimony involved. There's a great deal of interpretation involved. And that testimony and that interpretation is not necessarily authoritative and does not necessarily impose on us a responsibility to believe those things. But when there is an authoritative testimony, we do have a responsibility to believe such things. Truth obligates us to believe it. And an authentic, authoritative testimony from an apostle of Jesus Christ places a complete obligation on everyone who receives and hears that message to believe it. 
And indeed, Peter commands us who have believed this message to stand firm in it. But I want to address the first general audience to which I'm preaching, which is people undistinguished. And we need to understand that our culture is so relativistic, meaning they think that truth is relative. You have your truth, and I have my truth, and we should just be content to leave each other alone. And far be it from me to challenge or pressure you in any way or insinuate or imply or state that your truth is false. No, I'll, your truth is your truth. My truth is my truth. Truth is relative. And in fact, it's, it's hate to say that what I believe is wrong. Truth is not relative. And we are responsible to submit to the authority of the truth. The truth is authoritative. And the truth is assertive. It demands belief. So all who are here and know the truths of the gospel, the deity and humanity of Christ, Jesus is God in the flesh, his perfect life of obedience and innocence, his sacrificial death on the cross, and his resurrection from the dead on the third day. These truths and the testimony of the apostles to these truths demand and command your response. You must believe them, not as a take it or leave it, but as a life or death, heaven or hell ultimatum. Authority imposes and establishes responsibility. And the truths of the gospel confront us and make us responsible. But they confront us with the most beautiful and wonderful of truths. The most precious of truths. This is the true grace of God. You mean that God demands and commands that I believe his grace? Do you hear what you're saying? <laughs> Yes, absolutely. He demands and commands that you receive his grace freely and openly by believing in his son, Jesus Christ. The offer is free. This is what we talked about last week. The God of all grace who saves freely all those who call on him for mercy in the name of the Lord Jesus. So there's such an irony when someone says, you're being so narrow-minded or so imposing or whatever harsher words they would choose to, to present Christianity as somehow uh, dominating and hateful, we'd say, what is it that we are presenting to you? What is it that we are presenting to you? It's freedom. It's forgiveness. It's everlasting life. It's the grace of God in Jesus Christ. The offer is free, but it's also authoritative. And those who reject it, reject it to their own destruction. And those who refuse it, refuse it to their own peril. For we who have believed, and that is, those are the recipients of this letter more specifically, our responsibility clearly from the Apostle Peter is to stand firm in this true grace of God. To stand firm in it. This is in light of the persecutions they will endure. This is in light of the adversary that prowls around them. This is in light of the, the diverse and various trials that they must suffer from chapter 1, the mighty hand of God in chapter 5, as well as Satan prowling around. Stand firm in it. The emperor Nero will put you under pressure and say, renounce Jesus Christ or I will put you up on a pole, cover you with pitch, and burn you to death. Renounce Jesus Christ or we're going to clap and laugh as a lion tears you to pieces in the Colosseum. Reject Jesus Christ. And Peter's saying, this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. And you might say, and we mentioned this last week, Pastor, I, I believe this message. What do you mean stand firm in it? Well, we need to remember that faith is more than just a notional or intellectual knowledge of something. It's more than simply knowing the true grace of God. True faith assents, says this is, this is the true grace of God. I, I know the true grace of God and I, I believe it. I agree it is true. I assent to it. And, the, and true faith trusts in it 
And true faith stands firm by clinging. True faith resists doubt. True faith does not play with doubt and say, let's, let's, let's fight, not, uh, not fight, you do want to fight doubt, but let's wrestle with doubt until there's certainty. No, you banish doubt. You say this, the authenticity of this message and the authority of the messenger imposes on me a responsibility to believe its testimony and the doubts that assail my conscience and my thought, I must not entertain them, I must banish them. True faith stands firm by resisting doubt. True faith submits to the authority and the authenticity of the true grace of God declared by the apostles of Jesus Christ. So standing firm is resisting doubt. It's resisting pressure. It's deepening our knowledge. It's deepening our assent. It's deepening our trust. We, we don't have uh, time to read it, but if you read the chapter in our Confession of Faith on saving faith, you'll see that saving faith has many different acts. It does many different things. And we can stand firm in our faith by doing those various things that faith does. One of the things it mentions is that faith trembles at God's warnings and God's for, uh, prohibitions. Faith trembles? Yes, when God warns us. That's not a lack of faith, that's faith. That's even standing firm, lest we be presumptuous and cold. True faith submits to the authority and authenticity of the true grace of God declared by the apostles of Christ. And what's the outcome of persevering in true faith? Let's conclude by turning back to chapter 1 of 1 Peter. Peter says, this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. If we stand firm in the true grace of God, persevering with faith, what's the outcome? Chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Stand firm in it, because in this is your salvation. The God of all grace has called you to his eternal glory in Jesus Christ, and he will receive you into his eternal glory in Jesus Christ. Stand firm in the true grace of God, because this true grace is light, and this true grace is life forevermore from God and with God, to whom be the dominion and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, how we thank you that you have revealed the true grace that you have poured out on this world in Jesus Christ. It is not hidden. It is not a secret. It is not obscure and arcane, but rather it is public and it is bright. Please help us to be bright lights that give you glory in our good works, that give you glory in our joy, that give you glory in our obedience to do all that you have required of us and commanded to us. We ask you to forgive us for the many ways in which we have dishonored you or failed to give you the glory that, you, that is due unto you. We pray that you would help us to be more eager to glorify you by loving you and keeping your commands. We thank you that for all the dishonor of men, ourselves included, you remain blessed forever. And so we ascribe to you glory and honor and power and dominion because they belong to you. You are worthy of all praise. You are worthy of all obedience. You are worthy of all thanksgiving. We glorify you. We give you the glory that you being jealous for your own glory and rightfully so, should have it proclaimed in this world by us. Help us to do so. And help us to stand firm in that true grace that you have made known to us. 
Help us to stand firm in that true grace unto which you have called us. Help us to stand firm in that true grace that is already at work in our hearts and will bring us most certainly and surely to glory. Please help us, we ask, and answer our prayers for Jesus' sake.